Good evening, everybody. Could everybody slowly find your seats? I know we're very full and there's lots of space, so great. Thanks, everybody. And even before I begin, if you all got your cell phones, you want to grab them out and shut your cell phones down. Good evening. My name is Mark Fasir. I'm the director of the Portland Museum of Art. And on behalf of all my colleagues here at the museum and the board of trustees, we are very thankful to have PSA here tonight. Um, to have you all have your meeting here, to have you in our building, um, we treasure the work you do here in Maine. And I think having Moshe come here for this excellent talk tonight to talk about Portland. The Portland Museum of Art has been part of our past, our present, and in our future. So we're very proud to be the host of this um, astute, uh, wonderful occasion, all of these wonderful people. One shout out I do want to do is make sure while you're having drinks outside and you look at the bar, recently we reopened the museum with a beautiful art study room. And I'm really, really proud that Scott Simons Architects and Wright Ryan Construction and Jamie Johnston and Sherwood Hamill, some of our best local national folks, put together that beautiful space. So please do take a look at that room. And now I'd like to introduce and invite my friend Patrick Costin up to uh, introduce. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Good evening and welcome. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, both the museum, uh, our sponsors, Thornton Tomasetti, Becker Structural Engineering, and East Brown Cow for helping us put together this fabulous event. Uh, I'd also like to send out a special thank you to Carol Merrill, uh, PSA's Executive Director, uh, the staff at PMA, and the staff in Safdie's office who uh, have been working feverishly uh, to pull this event together and make it the success I know it'll be. PSA uh, is 10 years old this year. It was founded to strengthen community and fellowship amongst design professionals. A small group of architects 10 years ago came together to advocate for a regulatory environment that supported design excellence. PSA changed its names three years ago to invite community engagement in the organization. And I'm proud to see the room full uh, tonight. This reflected our deeper appreciation that architecture is a social art form. It engages the public in ways that other art forms do not. It physically frames our lives and reflects our culture and values. It forms the legacy of our civilization. <clears throat> this fall, PSA partnered with Creative Portland and Grow Smart Maine to host a day-long symposium titled The Challenge of Change. As a participant, two issues stand out for me, community competence and trust. Community competence is a concept that was referenced during the, con the conference by Richard Berenger from the Muskie School. It's the ability of a community to manage change successfully. Trust is the foundation upon which it's built. Portland needs to improve in both of these areas. PSA wants to help by organizing events, convening conversations, and bringing information and perspectives that strengthen our community's ability to chart its future. Change is accelerating worldwide. In the 10 years PSA has been around, 800 million more people have joined the planet the equivalent of adding the population of Germany each year for the past 10 years. Technology is reshaping our understanding of community. What was once local is now a global awareness of our relationship to one another. Human consciousness and social networks are expanding as the internet allows us to communicate in ways never before imagined. Portland is changing as well. After a long period of decline in the 20th century, we are seeing migration, immigration, and economic growth. Our city is poised to become one of the world's great urban centers, in my opinion. 
it is our chance to shine on the world stage. PSA aims to help the community meet the challenges of growth through forums like this one, where citizens are invited to arrive with open minds and open hearts to learn how we can change and grow for the better. How we change matters. Lack of trust will defeat us. We can follow our fears or be proactive and work together face to face, not just on Facebook, to craft solutions that will elevate Portland to new heights as a place to live, work, and raise a family. PSA will be proactive. So tonight we gather to be inspired to listen and to engage in dialogue about our community's future. Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all your energy not on fighting the old, but on building the new. We start building the new by learning from a master, not to imitate, but to understand what he seeks. Moshe Safdi is an architect urban planner, educator, theorist, and author. Over a celebrated 50-year career, Safdi has explored the essential principles of socially responsible design with a distinct visual language. Born in Haifa, Israel in 1938, Safdi graduated from McGill University in 1961 with a degree in architecture. After apprenticing with Louis Kahn, Safdie returned to Montreal to oversee the master plan for the 1967 World Exposition. In 1964, he established his own firm to realize Habitat 67, an adaption of his undergraduate thesis, which was the central feature of the exposition and a groundbreaking design in the history of architecture. In 1970, Safdie established the Jerusalem branch office, commencing an intense involvement with the rebuilding Jerusalem. He was responsible for major segments of the restoration of the old city and the reconstruction of the new center, linking the old and new cities. His work in Israel includes the new city of Modain, the Yad Vashem Holocaust Museum, and the Rabin Memorial Center. In 1978, after teaching at Yale, McGill, and Ben-Gurion Universities, Safdie relocated his residence and principal office to Boston. He served as director of the Urban Design Program at Harvard University Graduate School of Design from 1978 to 1984, and Ian Woodner, Professor of Architecture and Urban Design from 1984 to 1989. In the following decade, he was responsible for the design of six of Canada's principal public institutions, including the Quebec Museum of Civilization, the National Gallery of Canada, and, the, and Vancouver Library Square. Softies projects can be found in North and South America, the Middle East, the developing world, and throughout Asia and Australia, and includes airports, museums, performing arts, libraries, housing, mixed use, and entirely new cities. In the United States, he pioneered the idea of the library as an urban living room, Salt Lake City's public library. The performing arts is a catalyst for urban revitalization, the Kauffman Center for Performing Arts in Kansas City. The museum as a place of celebration and wonder, the Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in Arkansas. And numerous projects where mixed use is celebrated as the new public realm. Softy has been the recipient of numerous awards, honorary degrees, and civil honors, including the Companion of the Order of Canada, the Gold Medal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, and, and the Gold Medal of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, pardon me. He is the author of five books and numerous articles on the theory and practice of architecture. Moshe Safdi was awarded the Gold Medal uh, of the American Institute of Architects in 2015. Please join me in warmly, warmly welcoming our distinguished guest to Portland.
Thank you, Patrick. Pleasure to be here. I've gathered uh, that uh, I will speak about the planning uh, and urban design issues of Portland, uh, which of course I won't be able to do because I don't really know the city. But it's certainly a subject I have thought about a great deal and I have come over time to the city and have a sense of what it faces at this point in time. And I suppose when we talk about urban design and planning, we're talking about both policy and uh, urban design moves or the tools of urban design. At the level of, at the level of policy, there are questions of what density should the city develop at? What should the relationship of the old and the new be to each other? What should be the policy of conservation? Um, I suppose the ultimate question is what kind of, what character of city do you want to be? And these are questions that need to be debated and discussed. They're obviously influenced by extraordinarily powerful economic forces. I, I'm not naive to underestimate to what extent things are shaped by economic forces. But nevertheless, they need to be clear in terms of objectives. But the other side of the coin are the tools. What, what organizations of planning are in place? Uh, what is the attitude of the municipality, the state, to the regulatory mechanisms that can be put in place to guide urban growth? Um, and that is, of course, a very open and variable question. Um, there are, we think of places, I think of Singapore with its Urban Redevelopment Authority, I think of Boston in the years when I arrived there, 30 years ago, where the BRA was a planning entity that was proactive and tried to guide growth. But you also think of the many places where uh, they have pursued the market knows best. Um, I wrote an, an op-ed page for the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago about the densifying of New York and the challenges and issues that that raises. And I had a passage in the, in the piece that said, after all those years, uh, it's time now to resurrect the legitimacy and respectability of urban design after all those years of the market knows best. And so, you know, the fact checking goes on back and forth and at one point I get a call from the editor himself. And he says, Mr. Safdie, I, I need to rephrase things here, uh, if you don't mind. We don't like to say uh, after all these years of the market knows best. You know that we believe in the market, so can we say after many years of regulatory neglect Put it any way you want to. <laughs> um, but what I did try and point out in that article is that many megacities, we're not in a megacity here, uh, we're in a charming small city, but many megacities are going through paradigm change that the densification, the jump in density, you just look at the number of towers that are going up in New York at what's spacing and so on, that they are introducing completely new set of issues of light and air and, uh, and uh, certainly demanding planning tools which we don't seem to have in place for sure. Uh, so in terms of this evening I'd like to pull back and share with you some case studies. Some will be really situations where we, could, we acted as urban designers. We influenced the big picture. We continue to act as architects within that. Uh, others were opportunities where individual buildings, a library, a museum, were built by a community and it demonstrates to me, and I'd, li I'd like to illustrate, that each institutional building, I remember when this museum opened, I was here for the opening, 
is transformative for the town which, uh, puts it, which is building it. In other words, it becomes part of the identity of community. But much of that depends on the attitude of the designer uh, towards how, how a building, what is the objective, the urban objective of, of these buildings. Um, how does this fit into the professional discourse in architecture today? So I would say that, that there are, it seems to me today, two contrasting sensibilities. I think there is the uh, very uh, the dominant uh, sensibility today is that architecture is treated as an object. Uh, it is uh, the terminology that you that you hear out there is signature architecture, and the wow effect. Uh, you know, next time I the the next time I hear again the question, where is the wow effect in the presentation? The wow effect. But it, it is part of a, of a school of thought in which architecture is treated as highly personal, expressionistic. And I think that one of the consequences of that is the, the, the anal comparing and connecting architecture with the other visual arts. Um, but the other visual arts have somewhat different agendas. First of all, they don't, as we, as we heard in the introduction, it doesn't affect our, our public life, doesn't affect our personal life. But it's also in the nature, if you think of uh, uh, Ellsworth Kelly or you think of a Rothko, these are artists who were seeking personal, through their personal language to explore particular themes. They did not relate particularly to place or to materiality or to a particular cultural context, other than in the broader sense. But I think as architects, we must, we have no choice but to relate to all of that. So the opposing sensibility in architecture today is first of all to recognize that every time you put up a building, you're affecting a context that exists. It's an intervention into either the urban or the rural situation. And what will result at the end is a combination of what was there and what you've added. And once it, you think about it in these terms, the, the outcome is quite different. Because what has been there, what was there, be begins to inform and influence what you propose. And one of the things I'd like to emphasize in the series of institution building that I present today is that the fundamental search underlying all of them is to discover what is particular about a project, what is particular about the building. By particular, I mean its program, its purpose, uh, the content of it, uh, the materiality that is appropriate for constructing it, which varies from place to place. And more than that, how does it connect to the culture of a place, to the lifestyle of people, um, and even to its history and its heritage? And that is when you come to the fundamental question of past and present. The only way I think you could build contemporary, authentic buildings in the present and have them belong to the past is by really having a dialogue between the, the past and the present. And so, rather than leave that too abstract, let me start with a project in a city that has a very rich heritage, Jerusalem, where I've been working on for a number of years. This is the old city within the wall, and uh, I worked on the restoration of one of its quarters, but I want to talk about the center of the city, a center in the city that connects the old city, which you see here around the wall, and the new city around outside the walls, this area known as Mamilla, which used to be the no man's land of the city when it was divided for 19 years. Uh, you see here to what extent it is the bridge 
between downtown and the, the new city and the old city, but it's also the bridge between the Arab city and the Israeli Jewish city. And so it really is a crossroads. And not long ago, 150 years ago, this was the valley of water, all the cisterns which collected water to supply the town. Um, during the beginning of the 20th century, the city came out of the walls, and you see here many of the buildings that still exist, which I restored and integrated into this area. And then in the uh, 19 years of division of the city, this became no man's land. You see the concrete wall. It became a slum, fell apart. And it was in uh, 1970 that the government and the municipality of Jerusalem asked me to develop a master plan, an urban design plan for this area that is, uh, was, as you can see, substantially destroyed, but still with many historic semi-historic buildings within it. Well, the debate, as you can imagine, was extraordinary. Should this area be developed? Should it be a park? Is it possible? What should the program be? Um, I had proposed in a plan a mixed-use development, uh, mixed use of shopping streets, apartments, hotels, entertainment, and restoring the park into a, the valley into a park. Also, to serve the old city, which is a pedestrian zone, there are bus terminals and parking for 3,000 cars. Uh, could all that be done in a way that is harmonious with the scale of the old city? Uh, the opponents, and I'm telling you a story that took 30 years to resolve, the opponents, the Greens, the archaeologists said, don't touch it. Uh, it. It should be left alone, maybe a park, maybe whatever, gas district, uh, you know, gaslight district. My own conviction was that only with an intense mixed-use development, which brings people together, the marketplace, would you get all the people of the city to come in and interact with each other. And traditionally, that is where the people of Jerusalem of all different groups and religions used to meet in the marketplace. But to also balance it with open space, green, etc. Well, I won't, I won't go through the details of the 30-year debate. This was a, a, a model that we had built of the proposal with the valley uh, restored into a park, residential development, a shopping street that came across, and all of that a mix of the older buildings with much new construction. This is the area today, uh, a large terminal for buses and parking serves the old city completely covered by landscape, so it is concealed. Within it is a network of streets or alleys which are shopping streets, which are not a mall, not air conditioned, but really open streets. And you see here residential and hotel development with the old and the new buildings. So here it is. Uh, it was completed five years ago. So it took 35 years to achieve from beginning to end. And in that sequence, from a master plan that finally got approved, which I did for the government, came in developers who then retained us as architects to implement the buildings uh, 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 in terms of architectural uh, detailing. So these are new buildings, the shopping street going through, and you see here the spine running right through and then blending into the markets of the old city. Here we're looking from the city wall back to the residential and hotel area, the, the terminal covered with landscaping and the shopping going through apartments over shops, etc., and the grand stairs that descend from Jaffa Gate of the old city into the project, and then the uh, landscape walkway, which you see here below, and um, the subtle sort of mix between the older buildings of the 19th century and new construction. And what you see here is perhaps the greatest achievement one could have dreamt of 
the place is completely packed with people, day and night, and you see people from every group in the city, it actually has achieved this uh, social mix, uh, even in the tensest of days. And looking across is the, what, the residential village, which again is broken in scale to relate to the housing in the old city. Uh, parking is under these decks. Uh, the residences bridge over uh, the alleys, just as they do in the old city, but it's all done with new materials. These terraces open up at summer. They're convertible terraces. And though the scale and, and the use of stone, which is prescribed by the zoning in Jerusalem, all buildings must be built to relate to historic fabric and stone. Nevertheless, these are very contemporary building. And uh, at this point, there is no more debate. The conclusion is one, it's a very alive place. It completely transformed the city in terms of how it connects uh, the various parts. Uh, nobody at this point is saying it was not respectful to the heritage of the city. Uh, and it is a great commercial success for those who invested in it. So the best of all worlds. Um, I'll change scales and I want to talk about specific buildings, uh, library being one of them, and the same questions emerging at an individual building scale. Some, several years ago, we completed a library, uh, the public library of Vancouver. And something fascinating happened there uh, in the process. I won't show you the building, but I want to give it as, as background. Um, the program called for having uh, a space that's open 24 hours a day to the community that is sort of adjunct to the library, but it's not somewhere where you need to be go through security and checkbooks and so on. It's just a space for the community. And that was a fascinating idea. We ended up calling it the urban room. And the urban room is open 24 hours a day and people walk through it. It's sort of the ante room to the library. And uh, it has shops in it and coffee houses. Um, and it's, it kind of became the place in town to go to. So when Salt Lake called for a competition for its public library, which is in downtown Salt Lake, they had seen Vancouver and the program stated that they wanted an urban room. Um, and they wanted also, because of Salt Lake's summer winter climate, to have a great public piazza, uh, which would be full of life and, uh, and really bring life back to downtown. Now, unlike Vancouver, which is an intense downtown, intensely used, uh, very urban place in this almost European sense, Salt Lake has a 600 feet by 600 feet city, uh, city grid. Uh, each of the city streets, I think, is eight lanes, six or eight lanes, depending, so that the uh, the carriages could make a U-turn. Uh, that's the, where the tradition came from. It's hardly a place you could say is an intense downtown. And the competitors, of which we were one of five, received this master plan that indicated here a library, uh, a piazza in the center of the block, city hall is across the street, set in a park. And in addition to that, it proposed housing on the same block uh, with the idea that housing and library mix well and all that will work together. Well, I was baffled by why would anybody end up uh, coming into a piazza that's so far from these perimeter streets and what would give it intense life and so on. And so in, in the course of the competition, which was a, a fascinating one, because we were working during the competition with the library and city staff uh, in workshops to discuss the proposals, each of the architects. We had proposed that uh, there would be, uh, the public space would be strongly connected to the perimeter. It would be contained by kind of a crescent wall that had shops and cinemas and other attractions in it. Uh, the old library, which was there, would become uh, a science museum. We proposed a, a reading garden or a park on the roof of the library 
which would be connected from within, but also by that crescent wall which climbs up uh, to the top. We propose that the rest of the block be left open as a park for public activities, so that would encourage and allow housing to evolve at the perimeter across the street, but really make it public realm, completely public realm, the whole super block. And just in a little more detail, you see the library with its, this is an urban room. It is air conditioned and heated. You enter from the street, you come across from the light rail, you come across from city hall, and it spills out so that you, it's sort of a yin yang, indoor, outdoor, into the piazza, which has these shops, cinemas, auditoria, etc. So public life can go indoor and outdoor, transform seasonally, and that way there is a vitality that is not, does not become a seasonal experience. So this is a completed building. Uh, oops, sorry. Oops. Uh, my punchline. Uh, <laughs> you, you climb up the crescent wall, the park is on top, the piazza uh, is right in front, the entire library presents a, a glass wall very transparent glass wall to the piazza so that the life within the library and, and the piazza become uh, very uh, seductive and open. And so then began a debate as to what is this crescent wall all about and who's gonna climb up that wall and do I have a precedent? And as I mentioned to some, uh, uh, some people before, I had come back from China where I made a visit some years ago and so I had this precedent, which I put up as a proof that people will climb. <laughs> but they do climb, and the railing might be a bit too high, uh, <laughs> but such are the needs of security. And that is the reading garden on top, which looks across to the Wabash Mountains and is a very, uh, lots of weddings up there. And here we are flowing from the piazza into the urban room, and that is that space which really has a multiple life uh, of community activities. Uh, during the day, it's a serene place. People sit in the coffee houses, read a book. They cross the bridge to enter the control zone of the library. Uh, there are receptions and parties and exhibitions, as you see here. There are great formal dinners. Uh, it really is a place of community in the broadest sense. So that a library which in the, in historically has always been an introvert building, has always been an exclusive building, at least in its, in its message and feeling. In this case, it's extrovert, it's inviting, it, it draws the community into a wide range of activities. And in the same spirit, there is a teens library uh, proving to be too popular. They climb up this adventurous stair to a level where they have their own world. Um, and below us, under the shades that are manually drawn, is the children's library, which we see here, uh, which in itself spills out into the park and piazza outside with its amphitheater and uh, water features, etc. And you see here that transparency and visibility of the building. Uh, and that's what has been happening there um, uh, on summer weekends. And uh, there's uh, performances and concerts and art fairs and mountain climbers, as you see here. And we made it to Archie. So they're in the library, and I think it says, uh, <laughs> this is a world famous Salt Lake City public library. It's awesome. Wow and double wow. You see, wow comes in handy sometimes. <laughs> Throw a triple wow for me. So uh, closer to home. Uh, some years ago, we were asked, to build a major extension to the, Salt uh, to the um, Peabody Essex Museum, which 
uh, is on your way to Boston when you drive there. And some of you might be familiar with it. Um, it's the oldest museum in the country. And we were to triple its size. Um, this is old Salem from uh, uh, an old watercolor. But this is Salem today, which still maintains pretty consistently this scale of uh, delicate scale. Th this is relevant to the discussion of Portland because much of the, the a major question of building and expanding and densifying uh, uh, cities is the question of choosing scale. And the scale here is obviously a domestic scale. It's not the old federal buildings scale. It's more 19th century, but there it is. So the question was, how do you take 100,000 square feet major new building and, and fit that into this fabric in a way that, that is respectful of that scale? And so one of my early sketches was, let's break it down into uh, a series of houses. Uh, we call them house galleries. Uh, so the galleries become like individual buildings, and then they're woven together by some meandering glass roof that makes it into a singular museum. And this tied in also with a long negotiation we're having with the city. This, is a, this was a street, a public street. Uh, the old museum you see here. And as we were talking of expansion, the proposal was that we should jump the street because otherwise we would have to demolish too much of the old museum. And eventually, uh, in negotiations, it was agreed to have the street become internal museum street with two entrances so you can walk right through. At the same time, it brings you into what we call the common. And the common was that public space that wove together the old and the new parts of the museum. These are the house galleries and uh, an additional, and this is a uh, 18th century house that was brought in from China piece by piece and assembled as part of uh, the attractions of the museum. So you see here the overall mass. Uh, the street had, sorry, the street had been here uh, we created an alley to bypass going to the waterfront from the armory. There is rather a massive shopping uh, mall next to it, one of the gifts of the 1960s. Uh, and you see the rhythm of the houses. But of course, this is not just a formal urban design concept, although you can see how nicely it relates to the scale of the houses around the museum that the rhythm is, but uh, also there was a discussion, it would be nice to vary them, that they won't all be the same. And so I took a walk around the museum and right next to it is the Memorial Witch uh, Cemetery. And you can see how diverse the tombstones are and they found the geometry right into the building. Uh, it made the museum building committee quite nervous. They did not appreciate me showing that slide, actually. <laughs> so keep, keep your inspiration to yourself. Um, but this is its deeper meaning, because these house galleries actually allow the daylight to penetrate right through between them. So both levels of the galleries have daylight, uh, above through the skylights and below through these light shafts. So that would be an upper gallery. And that is a lower gallery, both the daylight. And this common is, again, a very versatile space. Everything from just the public hanging out and having coffee to lectures to uh, uh, weddings and dinners, etc. And it's shaded through this sail-like system, which recalls the maritime tradition of Salem and the fact that the museum was also founded by seamen, and you see here it's kind of drawn out. It was meant to draw out and in depending on the weather. When it's at winter, you let the sun in, they would withdraw, but everybody likes it so much it's never moved out. So I will again make a dramatic change in culture just because I think it emphasizes to what extent place becomes a central player 
in the evolution of a scheme. And the, the next project is the National Museum of the Sikhs in Punjab in India. Uh, and next to the uh, two hours by car from Chandigarh, which is a capital of Punjab that was designed by Le Corbusier. Um, and I came upon that, uh, the, the commission to design this through a very unusual route. I was in Israel on, on one of my trips and um, was told, got a call from the foreign ministry that the uh, chief minister of, the, of Punjab was on a state visit to Israel. Israel has a major irrigation program with the Punjabis and he had been taken as heads of states often are to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, which I had designed. And he was deeply moved and, and demanded to meet the architect. And so I went to see him uh, and he told me about how deeply moved he was and that the Sikh people had suffered a great deal, had survived persecution for hundreds of years in India. They're building the National Museum and he would like me to come and design it. Um, so the architects amongst us know what we go through to get a commission, uh, interviews, uh, uh, competitions, phase one and two, et cetera, et cetera. You're not used to getting a job on a, on a platter. So I was very skeptical, uh, but there was an airline ticket waiting for me, uh, and two weeks later, I was in India, and the first visit was to the Golden Temple, which is the sacred, the religious center of the Sikhs. Now the Sikhs, somewhat like the Jews, are confused about their identity because they are both a religion and a people. And the museum was to be a celebration of the history of the Sikhs, but as a secular institution, not as a religious institution. But nevertheless, there was an interesting uh, reflection on the meaning of this to the design of the museum. They took me to the, this town in which the last guru wrote the scriptures of the Sikhs. Uh, uh, it's a fortress town. And uh, we were to look at some sites quite far from the town. But I suggested we stay close. And uh, we are here looking from the town out and I was asking about those cliffs and the valley, and they said, because this is something you could walk to from the town, uh, it's a pilgrim town, and they said, you like that? And I said, yeah, I think that'd be terrific. So two weeks later, this was purchased. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we took the program. Uh, these were some of my early sketches Reflecting on the fortress town of India, this is Jaisalmer, which is a great fortress city in Rajasthan, growing out of the sand cliffs. And I was thinking in terms of the Sikh fortress tradition, how uh, the museum could rise out of the sand cliffs on either sides and the valley could become a water garden, which is so integral part of Sikh culture. And I came back with this model uh, with a historic museum, two levels across the water, the uh, auditorium, changing exhibition, and a library connected directly to the town and the temple. A uh, pedestrian bridge coming across uh, with a water garden in the valley by damming the stream and creating a series of, uh, of ponds. Uh, stainless steel roofs, uh, concrete and stone walls. Um, then there was a groundbreaking and half a million people showed up. <laughs> and uh, it it's clearly had a very central place uh, in, in, in the life of the Sikh community. Uh, as you can see here, all great uh, excitement. Um, and then we went back to Boston and started drawing and I came back, uh, still drawing, but they had built a pedestrian bridge. Uh, and so things were moving fast. Uh, this is the finished building. Uh, I think you get a little bit of a feel of the texture 
uh, of the surrounding with, the, with all these temples and fortresses and little town, uh, the water garden, the buildings are extending from downtown, crossing, and the galleries uh, within. We worked with many Indian designers and craftsmen on the exhibitions. We are here walking along the water garden. The restaurant is by the water. Um, and the Himalaya mountains in the background. And this is as you come from the side of the mountains, you see just the walls rising, uh, fortress-like. And the exhibits are all beautifully crafted. This is a six-story high space where the public ramps up level by level, telling you the full life cycle of rural sea communities and agriculture and so on, all carved out of cardboard and painted uh, extraordinary experience. And as often, the public and the exhibits merge into one. So how contrasting can we be? Crystal Bridges in Arkansas. And this is a, one of the more recent projects where Alice Walton uh, and her family decided to, that they will build a Museum of American Art, a collection that she's been building, gathering for some time, in Bentonville, Arkansas, where the family founded Walmart, and w which is still the headquarters of Walmart. Um, to give some context, oops, um, downtown Bentonville, and don't put your hopes up too much about downtown. <laughs> there is a square, and the little five and 10 uh, uh, Walton store, uh, but the town is a suburban dispersal that extends for miles. But a butting town is this family estate where the family house is, and it is, uh, the drainage creek with a number of springs, crystal springs being right there, uh, going down towards the north. And so I, as I walked the site with Alice Walton, the question was, where do we build? Uh, the natural inclination was build on the hilltops, but the hilltops are beautiful, uh, mature vegetation, lots of pines, and so it seemed to be somehow you should leave them alone, and so I propose that we build in the valley, in the stream bed, as you do the mill towns, where you go down because of the power for the, of the water, um, and leave the hills alone, and uh, around that, I propose that we build a couple of dams that would gather the, the spring water into ponds and build around those ponds. Uh, so you see here how the, the, how the ponds fit into the topography as you dam the flow. And that was one of my first sketches of how the museum would then grow like a cluster of <coughs> pavilions around that. Of course, that opened up a few questions uh, with the Corps of Engineers particularly. <laughs> this being a federal waterway, uh, I don't know why waterway, but uh, stream way it should be, but uh, the question was, how do we deal with floods? Because uh, Arkansas gets its floods. And then the question was, 100-year flood? No, 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 that's not good enough. We have precious air. 500-year flood. After long negotiations, end up being 3,500-year three, flood, <laughs> which I figure is the flood. So... <laughs> So there it is, uh, built, and uh, just to, again, this, the, the Crystal Springs is up there. This is the first dam and the second dam. The buildings themselves are bridges. They actually span across the water from end to end off these buttresses. 
And these are galleries. This is the social building and restaurant. This is auditorium and all purpose, curator block, library. And everywhere the building connects to nature. And the whole idea was how to experience art and nature simultaneously so that you are not in a museum and then you go outdoors. And we had visited the Louisiana Museum, um, which in, in uh, outside Copenhagen, which is one in which there is a real attempt to connect to nature all around it. But Alice also felt this was not a museum, it was a place of community, and that it should draw people of all ages, at all times, uh, something that's actually happened by providing a whole range of programs beyond just galleries and art and connecting it to the trails and to the bike paths and so on. And again, this, uh, you can see in the programming of this building and its siting and its location that it has transformed the community, that individual institutions are able to, to make extraordinary um, change for the better in the life of a community. This is a diagram that shows how this, the structure is entirely in wood, local Arkansas pine laminated into wood beams, laminated beams, and concrete walls with, with wood inlay. Uh, so all local materials. Under them are the galleries which you see tucked under with their own light filtering system. So you get lots of daylight coming in, and then you are able to control the light very precisely in the galleries themselves. So when you approach the museum from the hilltop, you hardly see anything but a drop off. And then you take these elevators, which stick up there, and you descend into a courtyard, and you are in the museum at the pond level. You see the wood beams enclosing, this is the, the restaurant and coffee shop with the ponds on either side and the cables stretching from side to side, picking up the loads of the, of the wood beams, looking out into the pond with galleries all around beyond. So you're always seeing the, the public moving around from gallery to gallery, and between each gallery, you're back connecting into nature. So here we're entering some of the sculpture outside, the water flowing under us. Uh, approaching a gallery, entering it with its very soft, even light over the art. And then again, the contemporary galleries and full circle again, looking out, and lounges that connect back to the stream beds that just flow right under the building. I'm going to change scales. And focus on the urban questions that are what I call mega scale in mega cities, um, which has been mostly what's been preoccupying our practice in the last 10 years. Mostly in projects in China, India, Singapore, uh, more recently Sri Lanka, in cities that are uh, one city, Chongqing, where our largest project is now under construction. Uh, when, uh, when I was commissioned, uh, when we were commissioned to do it, uh, and I said, where? They said, Chongqing. I said, where is that? It's the biggest city in the world, but I had never heard about it. Who's heard about Chongqing here? One hand, two hands, it's the biggest city in the world today, 33 million people and growing. So, it gives you a sense of the extraordinary transformation. And the first project that we got involved in, um, in Singapore it was, about 10 years ago, um, was a, what they call an integrated resort, which is a combination of hotels, convention centers, theaters, shopping, casino, um, and anything that would attract tourists, but also the si uh, residents of the city. It was initiated by the government of Singapore because they felt they needed to do something to, to expand tourism in, in the island. And we were approached by Las Vegas Sands to 
to develop a scheme on this landfill, which you see here. Oops, sorry. This is landfill, which formed the bay, which used to be the open harbor. And that landfill, that is the site for the integrated resort as we came upon it 10 years ago. Now, why, why, would, one, why would I want to do personally a casino? It was a question, actually, that my wife asked me. Uh, and, you know, my feeling about this project was the casino is 5% of the area. But the complex as a whole is really an opportunity to, to demonstrate that you can create a vital and exciting public realm uh, in a contemporary city at extraordinary densities with all the burden of parking and access and, and everything that goes with, with the density of this being 10 million square feet uh, gross density that, that goes with uh, contemporary urban development and show that you can do, transcend them all, I guess I would say simply, that you can do better than just having a mall. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is, as I explain the, show the project, is that this would not have happened, the project, in terms of its urban design, its architecture, its outcome, if it was not for the constant intervention of the government of Singapore through its urban renewal authority and through its uh, other development authorities. And, it starts with the way they put this out on the marketplace. Uh, if this was happening in the United States and this was government land, it would be subject to bids. And so a number of developers would be proposing bids and the highest bidder would get this, the, the project, inevitable. Government of Singapore said no. What we want here is something that is going to transform our state so design quality and program and the amenities that this brings to the community should govern the choice. So they fixed the price of the land at 800 million and said price is not an issue, it's fixed. Now we will pick from four developers, each with their own architect, the scheme that does the most for the city. So that's a good start. But beyond that, they also set very stringent urban design guidelines. Um, you see again the site from the direction of downtown looking out with the ships beyond. And it began with this diagram that said that this newly formed basin and the Singapore River that descends into it would become one continuous public promenade which links everywhere and which would be the spine of recreational life for the downtown area of Singapore. And all this water was cleaned up and uh, made into actually a water reservoir by damming it, uh, damming it over there as it went down to sea. And in addition to that, they requested view corridors that would penetrate the project so that it would not form a, a, a barrier to the water from the future development behind it. So these guidelines, as well as the method of, uh, of selection, were all things they put in place. Once they chose a design, which happy to say was ours, they then policed it through monthly reviews of the plans. And if the developer tried to switch things around and not deliver on some of the goodies they promised, uh, which they did from time to time, um, they were down on them saying, you had promised that, we had said that, we had controlled that. So in, this is really the result, successful result of public-private partnership, as the uh, lingo likes to call it. So this is the finished building, uh, complex is a better word, but I'll take you through the parts. Since they asked for the promenade to run across on the water edge, we decided that we would take our own commercial spine, which has shops and the theaters, and, and it's sort of, I call it the cardo, like in a Roman city, the main city spine, and integrate it so that we create an indoor-outdoor space. Rather than have a mall, which is internalized and completely cut off from the city, 
we said, let's make it indoor, outdoor. People can move in and out depending on the weather, daytime, nighttime. Everybody goes outdoor in Singapore at night. And that then connects, 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 connects. So it's not internalized. It's an extension of the movement system of the city. And so this kind of invention of indoor, outdoor then became the key so that you had the ex outdoor promenade and the water, and then you had several levels of shopping and restaurants and convention looking across. This connected to the subway, this connected to parking, this connected to the water, everything connecting in all directions. And you can see it here, this is the finished building with the outdoor waterfront with this great uh, event space that can seat thousands, these crystal pavilions with shops in the water floating, a museum of art science, which was this cultural contribution to the program, theaters, casino, convention center, the hotels, and every level then with its outdoor public spaces, all this being public outdoor promenade on the fifth level, and as you will see, a sky park of two and a half acres on top of the hotels. So again, in layers, the promenade outdoors with its cafes and shops along it, facing the water. And you see here, it's wood deck, the museum, the crystal pavilions. This is at night when there are events and shows and thousands uh, hang out there. Then the indoor part, which moves in and out, so you can always go outside, inside, cutting across at multiple levels. And the diagram that shows how park space occurs at every level of the project, and all of it public and accessible. So I would say all these moves mitigate density. Uh, they reinforce the quality of public life. None of it is privatized. In, this, in the way that many projects are. Uh, the hotels too, from the entrance of the hotel, which you see here, there is a continuous spine that runs across, which is open to the public at all times. So this spine of multi-level atria is really a public street. Then the entire west facade, east facade of the building is planted as it extends upwards. And the Sky Park was born out of uh, a moment in which we said, that how are we going to resolve the absence of generous public space which an integrated resort needs to have? If swimming pools and, and jogging paths and, uh, and uh, observatory and so on. And so at one point, the idea was, well, why don't we build it on top? Uh, it took some convincing. Uh, all the way from the uh, dismissal that Asians don't swim. Uh, well, they, they, it's so crowded up there, we wish we got five cents for every photograph taken. Uh, it's, uh, it, it just become a destination. But um, it, it, it is both private in terms of serving the hotel, but with a major public, public observatory. So I do believe that at that level of density, there are many, many things we as designers can do. And what I've written about, again, going back to the Wall Street Journal is we need new mechanisms. We, we need planning agencies that have the capacity to regulate, but also to initiate. Uh, if you think of the development of a town, it's not enough to tell people what they can't do. Zoning is basically a negative control. It tells you what you can't do. It rarely tells you what you should do. And zoning rarely thinks beyond the individual property. Uh, but urban design needs to think about how do you take five properties built by five uh, developers, each with their own architect, and make the total sum greater, uh, the, the, the total greater than the individual parts. Um, I would say one more thing in conclusion, uh, which comes back to the sort of underlying question of 
the emphasis for architects. We're, we're, I think, living at a time where, as architects, it's very hard to detach yourself from the body culture and the body politic. And it is the time of branding. Uh, everything is branded. Success is branded. Anything that just works a little bit is immediately packaged and regurgitated and, and uh, repeated. Uh, and architecture isn't that. Architecture is very particular. And if there is a curse to globalization, is it, it really forces everything to be the same. But I think beyond that, uh, the question is, what constitutes a design that has lasting power? What makes a building not feel five or 10 years later dated? Uh, and that quality of timelessness has to do, I think, with fitness. Uh, fitness in the Darwinian sense. I mean, if, when I'm asked what inspires me the most as an architect in terms of design, I always end up saying nature's design. Uh, nature's design in the sense that you observe through natural selection how a tree transforms from season to season, and you ask yourself, why doesn't architecture, architecture transform seasonally just the same as we go from winter to summer and closing, opening? Uh, why can nature design organisms that respond to climate so effectively and our buildings are so dumb and primitive? Um, and here's where technology comes together with new aspirations. Because we think of technology as a facilitator of computation, of drawing. Uh, architects are using computers quite effectively to design complicated buildings. But actually, this whole new technology, not only of computing, but manufacturing, can get us to be designing things much more organic, much more closer uh, to the way nature develops materials. Uh, so that they become much more responsive uh, to, to our needs. And I think out of this will emerge a very exciting new architecture which has a sense of beauty that anything with fitness in nature always has. And so uh, I think that if we seek fitness uh, and if we try and respond to program in a very cohesive and comprehensive way, we will achieve beauty uh, that we so much look, uh, seek to achieve. Thank you very much. reception outside, uh, and we ran a little over, but I think we have some time uh, for a few questions. So uh, first come, first serve, raise your hand, and we'll let uh, Osha decide who to call on. <laughs> Thank you. It's good that you ask. Uh, uh, I think that one of the keys to this question of mega cities is rethinking the car. Um, I wrote a book, I guess about 10 years ago, uh, which I called uh, City After the Automobile, with a misleading title, because I, I'm not suggesting that the, the automobile is out, but I am suggesting or insisting that the automobile must be rethought. Um, currently, your private car, which you need to park every time you don't use, uh, is simply uh, statistically impossible to resolve. There's no solution. You can build all the freeways and highways. At these densities, there's no solution. What I propose there is to transform, because people want the flexibility of a car, into automobile on demand, like the bicycles. You pick them up, you drop them wherever you want to and uh, demonstrating that once you did that, the number of cars, the number of cars that you need to park, uh, whether it's in an airport or in a building, is completely radically changed. And uh, 
So the argument is, will people give up their own personal vehicle? Uh, what we're seeing right now, which is, which is fascinating, zip cars and all over Europe, uh, electric little cars being parked in stations, uh, railway stations and airports to be picked up and dropped in a number of depots. So I think it's happening. It's happening before our nose, but I think the car within, and, and then you have the other technological changes of Google self-drive car and the others. Between that and car automobile on demand, I think within 10, 15 years, the whole vehicle car business is going to be transformed radically. It's happening fast now. Too bad the oil prices dropped. <laughs> but they'll come back up. Can't see. Uh, yes? Yeah, I, you know, I mentioned, I'm, I'm not sure I, know, I understand the nuance of your question, but so correct me if I'm going off the wrong way, but I mentioned economic forces. What I didn't tell you about Jerusalem was that while I completed my project without going high and uh, resisted and refused to have anything above eight stories, uh, and at the time recommended to the mayor that 12 stories should be the limit of all height in the historic city and its surrounding. And my, my uh, case was that if it's good enough for Washington, D.C., it's good enough for Jerusalem. And that prevailed for a number of years until the recent administrations, who not so much for economic reasons, although somewhat for economic reasons, but also for uh, misguided nationalistic reasons, like high-rise buildings of progress, and, um, and not to underestimate the, 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 the pressure of landowners for greater density, the, this restriction has blown away. So there are now 25 towers under construction and under design in uh, Jerusalem, and some of them by very eminent architects. Um, so for Portland, I think that one of the questions is, if you go with a, if you go with a current of development, uh, which you can see in so many towns that sort of had a push, uh, the typology of contemporary buildings is going to mean some disjuncture with what's here. So what is it going to take to avoid doing that? And I think serious thinking about scale and restricting it in spite of landowners' pressure and finding also mechanisms. If you own a historic property and its density is very low, compensate the owner by density rights, which New York is doing now, transfer them to another property, but all in which still needs to preserve a particular scale. And I think it's important to do and it's important to take position about it. And I don't think it's bad business. I don't think that, that the value of land needs to diminish. I think that, that one can demonstrate the workability of it from a, the economic real estate perspective. As long as it's clear, it's when there is ambiguity that you get people challenging the zoning and changing the zoning and the corruption that goes around it. Uh, but in a place that is essentially law and order, um, it should be possible to do. Should it be possible to talk about the palette of material? This is a brick city. I mean, you, you, you arrive here and you just feel the power of the brick. Now, I'm not saying every building needs to be brick in the future, but one needs to recognize that there are certain qualities that you want to preserve. Then if there is, you know, a giant office park that needs to be built, it can, it can be located in a way that, in a place that's not in the middle of the harbor. It's, again, planning, planning, and urban design. So good luck. <laughs> no more hands. 
right? Are you ready to call it? Everybody. to thank everybody for coming and uh, please enjoy the food and drinks outside and uh, continue the conversation in the community. This thank you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. nice yeah. Mature, I mean, I guess a lot of architects. Yeah. Yeah.